Right. Oh, I think it's all broadcasting now. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Well, good morning, ICB bookkeepers. I'm delighted that you've been able to join us for today's GDPR webinar. Uh, we have our in-house GDPR expert and legal counsel, Ben Stevens-Brown, here to talk to us about GDPR. He produced the documents that we released to members in practice and um, those were free for members in practice they have now been made available in the shop to buy for 99 pounds which uh, we think is is quite a subsidized rate compared to other products that are available and um, have been mentioned to some of our members uh, that can be costing upwards of 800 pounds um, so those three documents, that's the GDPR general guidance, there's a, a shorter getting ready for GDPR guide and then obviously the privacy policy template itself. So what I'm going to do is just ask everybody please to confirm that they can hear us. Is there anybody there? We've got a chat function that you can open up on the right hand side of your screen and then you can write messages like this. I'm just going to try testing to make sure everyone can hear me as well. Oh yes, fantastic. Hi Selena. Hi CEM Bookkeeping. Hello John. Hello Julia Banks. Hello Laura. Oh, Fabulous. Okay. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, so just to explain, there's a chat function on the right hand side. Oh hi everybody. Good morning. I hope you're all powered by coffee and tea or water. Uh, and there's also a QA and a uh, function. You can access the Q&A at the bottom of the video screen. And uh, I would ask if you've got any specific questions you would like to ask, uh, we will try to get Ben to answer as many as possible. So if you do that through the Q&A uh, system that is available at the bottom of the video screen, and then we'll try and go through as many as possible. So without further ado, we're going to hand it over to Ben. He'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to the Q&As. All right, thank you very much, Ben, take it away. Okay, um, well, good morning everyone. Thank you very much for attending. I'm going to rattle on uh, quite quickly through the overarching elements of the GDPR just to give everyone a bit more, I don't know, a detail of it really. So I, like everyone else, I'm sure is receiving lots of emails at the moment from every company you've ever come across, basically asking that you consent to them continuing to use the data. The reason that they have to do this is because there isn't any other relationship uh, between you and this and these companies other than marketing and on that basis if it's just a marketing relationship they have to get consent. So what I'm going to quickly run through are the principles of GDPR. So every bit of data that you get coming in to you, you just need to apply these principles and as long as you are doing that it should mean that the data is running through in a GDPR compliant manner. So the six principles are, well, the first is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. And that just means that you can't do anything illegal with the data. So that hasn't really changed. You need to be uh, deal with the data in a fair manner. So you need to acknowledge your client's rights and deal with it fairly in accordance with those rights. And you have to be transparent in how you deal with the data. Now, what that means is that under the GDPR, you have to let your clients know the lawful basis that you're processing the data and you let, need to let your clients know the rights and your obligations regarding that data and what you can't do is no longer hide behind very wordy documents or have your GDPR policy submerged in the middle of a lengthy contract it all needs to be clear and open and these are things that the GDPR has brought in to address issues that came under the Data Protection Act so you need to be very open with your clients about how you're dealing with the data that's the first principle the second principle is purpose limitation so you need to have a very limited purpose for dealing with the data you can't get data from mr x for dealing with your bookkeeping contract and then decide well actually i'm, I'm going to use the data for a bit of marketing on the side but unless you've agreed in the initial well agreement with your client that that's that's what you're going to do so you have to let your client know the specific purpose you're using that data for and stick to it. The th third principle is data minimization. You can't start asking your client for all sorts of data and in turn people can't ask for all sorts of data from you anymore. Accuracy, you need to make sure the data is accurate. Storage limitation, you need to keep the data for the limited period. Now what has 
happened a couple of times is that people have asked, well, does GDPR trump various other bits of legislation? And it doesn't. The other bits of legislation are very important as well. They still are in place. So things like the Companies Act, the Tax Act, you still need to keep all of the accounts in line with those for a period of six years and the rest. Your legal obligations and that haven't changed at all. So that's legitimate interest for keeping it. Even if the client contacts you and says, I, I want to be forgotten, you have to adhere to these legal obligations, the same as you always have done under the Data Protection Act. Finally, the last is integrity and confidentiality. So that just means you need to not share the client's personal data. So in essence, the principles have come in, these six principles, and they're not very different at all from the Data Protection Act, to be honest with you. It's gone down from the eight principles under the Data Protection Act to six under the GDPR. But they've done that by just making the six principles a little bit vaguer so they can encompass more. What has changed is that you now need to let your client know the lawful basis for processing the data. Now we've, or ICB have advised its bookkeepers to rely on the contractual basis. So one of the lawful basis you can rely on is you need to process the data to fulfill a contract. So for every business that's got a contract, you can rely on that as a lawful basis, but you need to let your client know that's the basis. One of the other basis for, one of the other lawful basis is consent and for marketing there's no other relationship, you have to have express consent. But the issue with consent is if you're processing the data on the basis of consent and the client says, well, actually, I don't want you to process my data anymore, you have to stop. And so if you're relying on that and you've got a bookkeeping contract, you can get into all sorts of trouble because GDPR says you have to stop processing it. But in order to fulfill your contract and your other legal obligations, you would need to continue processing it. So ICB have said rely on Article 6, 1B, which is performance of contract for the lawful basis. There are other legal basis such as you need to process it for compliance with another legal obligation. So that could be the Companies Act or equally the Tax Act, making sure that you process it for the obligations you have for HMRC and the rest. There are three other lawful basis, but they're not really going to be effect well, they're unlikely to come up unless you're a governmental body. Really things like protecting the vital interests of your clients, uh, carrying out tasks in the interests of well, maintaining public interest and or a legitimate interest as well. Now legitimate interest is quite interesting because it means if you do have a relationship with a data subject, so you're processing data for your clients, you can rely on a legitimate interest to send emails to your client and just let them know about new products that are on the market, new services that you're offering because you have that relationship anyway, a contractual relationship or a membership relationship, then you can actually rely on the Article 6 1F lawful basis of legitimate interest to contact them for other aspects that are outside the contract. So quickly moving on, I'm just going to run through seven steps really you need to take to make sure your practice is GDPR compliant. And the first that we're getting a lot is a lot of questions on is does my practice need to be registered with the ICO as a data controller? The ICO or the Information Commissioner's Office is the body that's been appointed by the European Commission to regulate all of the GDPR in the UK. So they're the people in charge of everything. They've got a brilliant website and on their website they have a multiple choice questionnaire. It's, a, it's about six pages. You can quickly whip through it. It should only take about five minutes. And what they do is basically let you know whether you need to be registered with them as a data controller or not. If you do, it's about £35, I think, for uh, to register. And then that means that the ICO have your details. The exemptions that would mean you wouldn't have to apply, generally, if you're doing voluntary work or you're doing work for charities. But other than that, most people will have to log on as a data controller with the ICO. But run through the test. You can go on their website, just type ICO into Google and it should be there. So we've discussed the lawful basis that you can rely on. Um, ICB's recommendation is that, that you rely on the performance for a contract or fulfilling your contract as the lawful basis. The next thing you need to do is look at your business and prepare a bit of a flow graph, really, of how person small data comes into your business and then run through the steps, look at the security measures you've got in place and how you can mitigate those risks. So what I've done is I'm going to show it up now. I've prepared a 
Well, I don't know if you can see that. It's my attempt at showing a bit of a data flow, but breaking it down, you've got data collection stage, the data processing stage, the data storage stage, the data transfer and the data destruction. And at each point, you'll have risks and security measures that you can put in place. Now, most of you will probably have security measures in place already. You'll have antivirus software on your computers. You'll have a, uh, let me see, password on your computer. You may be using password protections on various files that you send. They're all security measures that you have in place already. If you're working from home, your house probably has a burglar alarm and a locked door. You may be keeping your loose papers in a safe. All of those, again, are security measures. And it's important uh, to basically look at the risk of a data breach and have in place just somewhere in writing that I've looked at the risk to the data breach and, and I've put measures in place or I have measures in place and list them because that can be used as a defense in case there is a data breach further down the line and uh, the client wants to take action or the ICO are doing an investigation. Now I don't mean to scare anyone because the 25th of May is going to come and it's going to pass and if you haven't been subject to a number of data breaches and a number of attacks that's not really going to change because of the date and GDPR coming in. Now I appreciate that you may be hearing a slightly different story from various marketing companies who are saying oh well you'll need to have this £3,000 encryption model onto your computer or we can come in and for the mere price of £1,000 run through all of your systems and make sure that you are GDPR compliant. That's not what the GDPR recommends. The GDPR basically recommends that everyone does an internal data assessment. And I'll run on to that because it is mentioned in the GDPR itself. You do a risk assessment yourself. You take into account things like costs and the likelihood of a data breach and whether uh, a data breach would risk the freedom and rights of your clients. So really the GDPR, I'm going to bore everyone very quickly, came in because there was a global data agreement or mechanism that was working, it was called Safe Harbor. It was used by the USA and everything that was transferred globally came under Safe Harbor. However, the European Commission got together and said, actually Safe Harbor isn't good enough. And this has been highlighted. You, I'm sure you, everyone's heard the newspaper stories about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and how personal data now has a value and a net worth and it's all been trading off under under counters really so the european commission came in with the gdpr this has raised the stakes so that's where the gdpr comes in really but the gdpr is not a one size fits all it recognizes you've got small businesses medium businesses and, and huge multinationals and then social media platforms like Facebook and instagram where there's a huge amount of personal data that's kept and sold um, on a larger basis and they're going to be the people who GDPR is really aimed at the first lit litigations under GDPR and the rest because there will be some will be on these big social platforms so I think people uh, should remember back in 1999 the Y2K bug when that came out there was a lot of panic you need this particular bit of software otherwise your computer will crash and planes will fall out the sky and lo and behold it didn't really happen what happened is that 2000 January the first happened and, and nothing really had changed very much so GDPR will come in you do need to be compliant with it because it is the law but this panic that's surrounding it does need to be dialed back a bit but I, I appreciate people are selling packages for extortion amounts of money here um, not ICB incidentally very reasonable um, what I am going to quickly move on to is Within your own practice, you need to look at who's responsible for managing your GDPR procedures and policies. And if you're a self-trader, this will be you, but you may have other employees and you can divide up those responsibilities amongst yourselves. And you need to work out how you're gonna communicate your GDPR policies and whether the clients are aware of their rights. So within your practice, I'm just gonna break it down. For GDPR purposes, you'll have the data subjects. These are the people who you are holding personal data on, your clients. There's the data controller, which is generally going to be your organization. It could potentially be um, you as a sole trader. However, ICB recommends you put your company in name in as, if possible, because if there is a data breach, what will happen is you will be liable for that data breach if you're registered as the data controller. And if your company's registered as the data controller at the ICO, then your company's liable and there's limitations to that as opposed to your house and car being on the line if it's you. 
you can appoint a privacy manager if you've got employees and they they would be in charge of making sure that your company's gdpr compliant and everyone's trained and you've got data users who are standard employees um if you're a sole trader and you can't appoint the company as a question that's just come in you will have to register as the data controller yourself um, and if that's the case then you just need to make sure that you're gdpr compliant but we are talking worst case scenario so don't panic too much because just think how many data breaches you've had up to this point um, after the 25th of may that's unlikely to change so I'm afraid, unfortunately, a tendency of solicitors is to always work on a worst case scenario. That's that's what we're preparing against. So another question has come in is, are we controllers or processors? The easy way to work this out is if you've got the personal data coming in and you've collected it from the client, you're going to be the data controller. If you're passing the data out to a third party with specific instructions of what they can do with that data, they become a data processor. So a data processor is anyone's outside your business who you're passing the data on with specific instructions of what you want them to do with the data. A data controller is a person who has that personal data for one of the lawful basis that we've mentioned. So you as a bookkeeper fulfilling your contract as a bookkeeper, you're the data controller. You're in control of the personal data. If you need to pass some of that data out, so you need to subcontract some of the data or you need for various other services to pass some of that data out for sorting, then those people you're passing it to are the data processors. Now, there may be some cases where you're the data processor. So payroll, for example, the client is going to be the data controller of their employees and in turn that they're in charge of the privacy management and they're passing their their employees details on to you and in that respect because they're asking you to do very specific things you're a data processor for the employees on the payroll but as you can see it's over it, right, it could get overly complicated if you have a chain link going down so i'm quickly going to move on because um it well it is a bit of a confusing issue if you the more the more you think about it and the more people who enter into that chain it just becomes fairly linked so data processors what you will need for anyone you're passing the personal data on to is a contract and gdpr recommends that you have some contract or some sort of agreement in place now a contract doesn't have to be in writing it can be verbal but you will need four elements of a contract in order for a contract to exist which is the offer which is either an offer of services or goods acceptance someone agrees to take those services or goods and you'll need a consideration which is generally payment and an intention to create uh, legal relations now if you've got those four elements you have a contract whether it's verbal or whether it's writing icb recommends always that you have something in writing because if you get down the line and there's a disagreement again dealing with worst case scenarios if you've got it in writing you can both say well actually you said this and i said that and we've got a record of it as opposed to verbal agreements which who said what can always be a bit contentious down the line so anyway, with a data processor, GDPR recommends that you get some sort of contract in place. You'll probably already have a contract in place with anyone you're passing the data on to or with your clients when you're taking data from payroll, for example, from them. And you can either refer to your GDPR policy in that and say that data processors you're passing data on need to be GDPR compliant. Or equally, your clients may say you as the bookkeeper need to be GDPR compliant. The important thing about the data processor relationship is you're all GDPR compliant and that's dealt with at article 28 of the GDPR if you're interested to have a look it basically runs through things that you need to check but the basis of it is everyone needs to be GDPR compliant and you need to make sure that anyone you're passing the data on is GDPR compliant as well so what you may have in some instances is data processors are outside the UK. Now this includes any software package you're using for your accounts where the software company has servers based outside the UK. So if that's the case, then you need to check a couple of things really. The first is if they're outside Europe or the UK, they don't have to be GDPR compliant. And there's a lot of USA companies who have servers outside of the UK and if that's the case what you need to do is check on their website look at their privacy policy and they should have something called the EU US Privacy Shield and the EU US Privacy Shield is the USA's attempt to catch up with Europe regarding data protection so it's a mechanism that they've got in place 
not every country company sorry in the usa has to sign up to it it's self-certification but if they do the g european commission recognizes it as being gdpr compliant so step one check any software company's privacy policy that you're using and they'll either say they're gdpr compliant or they've got the eu us privacy shield in place if they don't have that what they should have is european model contract clauses in place now these are contracts that have been drawn up by the european commission for countries outside of the usa and europe and the uk where they basically contract into the gdpr so again if you see model contract clauses approved by the european commission eu us privacy shield these are all very good things that mean that the people you're transferring the data to are gdpr compliant now regarding your looking at your own business and the security measures you have in place to make sure your business is gdpr compliant you've got the security measures you need to take into account now these are dealt with in the gdpr the GD gdpr is all online all the regulations there's article 32 of the gdpr and i'm going to basically say what it says because there's lots of people says who've said you need encryption you need to have passwords you need to have various other aspects in the gdpr doesn't specify anything that you need it is a common sense approach of looking at the data risks that your data is um at risk of if should there be a breach so article 32 one says taking into account the state of the art so that's the technology you're using the costs of implementation so what's a reasonable cost for your business to spend on uh security and the rest the nature scope and context and the purposes of processing as well as the risk of varying likelihood and severity for rights and freedoms of natural persons which is basically a very long-winded loyally way of saying do a risk assessment <laughs> um, look at the damage that could be caused if that data is linked is is leaked but also look at how you're processing the data and the leaks that could occur and take sensible action take into account the costs of buying a three thousand five thousand pound encryption system if you've only got five clients is it is it really necessary the gdpr is very much uh recommending that everyone has a look individually at the own risks that their business is subject to and no one no one is going to know your business better than you you're the people in the driving seat you're the people who have the day-to-day -day dealings with it so you're the people best place to have a look at the security risks of where data could could go missing now under the gdpr some of the things you do need to do the obligations are you need to let your clients know particular things one is the lawful basis on which you're processing the data and another one is your clients rights now under gdpr your clients and anyone who's a data subject so you as a data subject if someone else has your personal data now have rights of what you can do regarding or claim regarding that data you have the right to request or your clients have the right to request any personal data that's being held about them and that has to be given to them in a transparent or clear fashion and it has to be done free of charge under the data protection act you can charge i think around 10 pounds you can't charge anything at all unless those requests are unreasonable or repetitive or someone's just being a bit of a pain and requesting a repeated well repeatedly requesting information so what you also have to do is let your clients know that they can withdraw their consent for of you processing the data for marketing purposes they can ask that their personal data be amended if it's inaccurate and they have the right to request that they be forgotten however this is a bit of a sticky subject because although someone now has the right to be forgotten what they don't have the right to do is override any of your other obligations under any of the other laws so you have to continue keeping the accounts in line with the companies act in line with the tax act you have to keep obliging all these other legislation that hasn't changed at all really all that's really changed is that you need to let your clients well you needed a bit of a risk assessment of your business but you would have had to have done that under data protection act anyway you need to let your clients know the lawful basis and you need to just let your clients know a little bit more about their rights um so what you can also so what, what you'll also have to let your clients know is they can request certain restrictions on the processing of their personal data if some of the data is inaccurate and that they're allowed to receive a copy of their personal data and it has to be in a clear format that's readily understandable there's something called data portability as well which is that your clients have the right 
to have their data processed by another data controller so you can ask that all of the data you have be passed on to another data controller however again it doesn't extinguish your rights under the companies act and the tax act you have to maintain the accounts for those purposes that hasn't changed so um quickly moving on GDPR also deals with breaches of security now. Now what it does say is that if there is a data leak for whatever reason and you've got sufficient security measures in place so that someone couldn't access the data, so let's say you lose a USB stick or you lose some documents but the USB stick's passworded or encrypted or an email is intercepted but it's got a password on, um, you, you can manage it internally. If there's not a risk that that information is readily available, you can manage the data breach internally. You don't have to report it to the ICO. You don't have to report it to your clients. However, if there is a risk that that data has gotten out or you've left a set of accounts on the train, those sorts of things, it's an unlocked briefcase, then you would have to let your clients know. You need to let them know without, without uh, any delay. You also need to let the ICO know in 72 hours. Now, this is where the security measures come in because if there is a data breach it's a defense for you to say well look i had these security measures in place that was to mitigate the risk of there being uh, any data breaches and if the ico who are in charge of the entire regulation aspects of it say well actually that's the very reasonable security measures we wouldn't expect you to do any more than that or that sounds very sensible then then you've got a defense to that data breach um We've spoken very closely with the ICO. We've worked with the Information Commissioner's Office in preparing the documents that we've put online. And the ICO have stressed repeatedly they're not a punitive body. They're not here to start punishing and firing out fines left, right and centre. Their entire purpose is to try and make sure everyone is abiding by the GDPR, to try and assist people abiding by the GDPR. And the various fines that they've got in place are really only going to be used if people are negligent, uh, I don't know, throwing bits of data out the window, doing all sorts. They're really only going to step in if people aren't doing what's what what's required. And GDPR is just the same as any other law, really. You just have to abide by the regulations. But this panic that's that's been driven a bit is um, needs to be dialed back. Anyway, I think I've probably come to the end of my uh, little spiel. So I'm happy to take any questions. That was fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, I would hope a reassuring message uh, that really what you need to do is an internal data assessment and just, yeah, make, a, make an assessment on your business and have, take a measured approach that's in line with, you know, your budget constraints, your time constraints and, uh, and the way you process the data for your clients. Um, so we have been having uh, receiving a couple of questions. Our, we did this webinar obviously on Tuesday. And we had 36 questions, by the way. So we've got that as a as a benchmark. Um, Judy Wilkinson has asked: I run an accountancy firm and I subcontract work to other bookkeepers. Yep. The way I see it is that when we process our clients' work, we need a privacy policy for the clients. Yeah. And when we send work to subcontractors to process this information, we need a separate privacy policy for the data processor? Um, you don't need a separate privacy policy for the data processor because what you need is basically a privacy policy that says you're compliant with GDPR and basically outlines all the steps that you're doing for that. What you will need with your data processor is a contractor agreement that basically ensures that you're both adhering to the GDPR. Now under the GDPR, if you're passing data to subcontractors or data processes and there's a breach at their end, you as the data controller are liable at the end of the day to coin the Americanistic term of pass the buck, the buck stops with the data controller always. So if you're subcontracting out, although you could potentially um, include a claim against the data processor, you are liable for any breaches that happen at the data processes element of the relationship as well so it's very important that you do have something in place that protects yourself in that relationship um, so clearly defining the responsibilities that should be in your contract with your data processes anyway but you can refer in your contract with your data processes to your privacy policy and along the lines of saying something that you're you expect them to adhere to the privacy policy that you've got in place and you expect or that 
the contracts fulfilled under the agreement or understanding that they are GDPR compliant. Now you can check their privacy policies and make sure that they've got a privacy policy in place, or you can check your own one and make sure that they agree to opt into that as part of the contract. But e either, either way, you need to make sure that both of you are GDPR compliant in the relationship. I suppose the difference is with your client, they don't have to be GDPR compliant. Um, it would be great if they were, but whether they're GDPR compliant or not is their own issue. With data processors, you're on the line with that. So you do need something in place to make sure that GDPR compliance is agreed and you have checked for it or you've taken appropriate steps to ensure that it, that it is in place. That is, I think that was very clear. Julie Wilkinson has just asked for further clarification. Do we need to oversee and risk assess their privacy policy? No. They're just the data well, processors. Oh, sorry, for the data processors. Sorry, I thought you meant for the clients. You mean for the oh, data processors? Yeah. Sorry. Um, you should, because it will help protect your situation. You don't have to, um, but you should at, at least get some sort of confirmation that from them in writing that they're saying that they are GDPR compliant. There's nothing that says that you have to check the privacy policy. However, again, dealing with the worst case scenario, if there is a breach at the data processor's end, you are in, in the firing line for that breach, basically as, as you're a joined party to it. Um, so it would make sense to make sure that they do have a privacy policy in place. You don't have to, you could do something along the lines of, the contract going forward or add an extra variation sheet or appendix to the current contract basically stating that they agree to adhere to your GDPR policy or they are GDPR compliant something along those lines but it is probably worth checking with your data processes anyone you're passing personal data on where there is a risk that that personal data could be leaked that you've got something in place just to protect yourselves but again i'm dealing in worst case scenarios here and carol has just asked she says the icb privacy notice mentions who we may share information with and yes. to whom we can disclose it aren't they both the same people and organizations well sharing the information is passing the data on and disclosing it is making it available to read. So when you're sharing it, it's along lines of store, having someone else store the data as well. So I suppose the TCSP, uh, to pick a contentious subject, the trust company and service provider information at the moment, HMRC under the money laundering regulations have to have a register in place of all the trust and company service providers up and down the country. Anyone providing those services who isn't on that list is acting unlawfully and there's supervisors including the ICB have been drafted in by the HMRC to um, ensure compliance with those policies so in that case you're sh the data is being shared uh, by ICB with HMRC because the data is going off to HMRC and HMRC is storing it however regarding disclosing the information that that would be along lines of someone let's say HMRC asking us a particular question about a client or some other information and us relaying the information to them but it doesn't have that storage element attached to it but to be honest with you we're getting down to semantics on a legal basis <laughs> and uh, you can basically use what what words suit you um, and in turn regarding any contracts, the actual intentions behind the words and the meanings behind it are always the contested points. So uh, it, it's up to you how you want to use disclosure and sharing at the end of the day. We've got a couple of questions here that I think may need you just to run over to what I would think is a, is a question of uh, making that risk assessment yourself. Yes. Um, Really, someone said, uh, okay, well, so do I need to send my GDPR policy to my clients? Someone else has said, should I reissue the contract? Do I need to be asking consent for the email accounts? We did cover this a little bit at the beginning. And, uh, you know, can I share people's receipts on Dropbox? Can I send pay slips in an okay. email? Um, yeah. um, so I'm, I'm, Dropbox is EU US Privacy Shield uh, approved. So they are GDPR consider GDPR uh, compliant or, or 
they have adequate security measures in place regarding it. They, I've also saw a question arise of, of you've been told that sending payslips is illegal if, and, and it's not. You can have a look online, have a look at the GDPR online, the regulations are all there in a PDF format. Go to, I'll tell you the article to go to right now actually, which is all to do deal with security measures. It's article 32 and it, they basically make suggestions. They basically, GDPR only makes suggestions on things that you could do. You could use um, pseudonymization. You could use encryption, uh, but you need to assess the risk yourself. There's nothing that says it's unlawful or it's illegal. I'm not too sure where this has come from. I'm assuming it's from people who haven't really read the GDPR and, and have jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, well, you, well, you need our encryption software. I'm very sorry, but it, it, it's only 2,000 pounds, which is a steal. Um, you need to have a look at it. Dropbox, I think the business as side of Dropbox um, has encryption in place already. You can send links out to that. The GDPR specifies that it's down to each business just to assess the risks themselves regarding the data. Now, regarding pay slips and the rest, um, you could use a password on the files that you're sending. You could use encryption or links using Dropbox. You, you can use a number of different security measures, but it's up to you to assess the risk. There isn't a mandatory way of doing these things. Um, oh, sorry. I've... Well, so could you say if in terms of payroll, you're the data processor because it's the client's yes. employee data. So the yes. client is the controller. If do you, could, is it worth saying to the client, can you just, you know, email me to say that you're happy for me to continue emailing payslips? And then it's the client's responsibility as the controller. Well, it will be your, the client's responsibility anyway regarding the controller. The, you don't need consent. Uh, the, law, the lawful basis, uh, which is down, back to Article 6, 1B, that you can rely on for all of your bookkeeping is that it's necessary to process the data for the performance of a contract. You don't need any written consent from your clients regarding this. They don't need to sign anything. You can just process the data on the basis that if you're not processing the data, you can't fulfill your bookkeeping contract. There's no way you could do it. And so you can just rely on that. And that was the ICO's recommendation because when we approached the ICO initially, ICB said, well, should, should our members be getting consent from their clients for processing the data? And the ICO was like, no, 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 you shouldn't rely on consent because as soon as you rely on consent, you're giving your clients the opportunity to withdraw that consent. And as soon as the consent's withdrawn, you can't process the data anymore. That's the risk with using consent as a lawful basis. And so you should really try and rely on the uh, article one, six, one B of using the performance of the contract as the lawful basis for processing it. In the relationship with payroll, the client is going to be the data controller. They're in charge of the personal data of their employees. There's, there's nothing much that's going to change that. So protecting yourself regarding it, you can clarify the position and say, uh, because you are the employer of these particular people you are the data controller and I'm a data processor in this respect um, and we're carrying on forward and on that basis and see what they say but at the end of the day it's 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 fairly clear under the GDPR that the data controller is the person who's getting the personal data in and as soon as you start sending that personal data out to third parties with specific instructions attached on how they deal with that data then they become the data processor so payroll the employer's the data controller regardless of what they do or say really and you're the data processor of their employees who you're doing the pay payroll for. So take a measured approach but it measured. is not illegal. So Paul Clulo has been told specifically it is illegal to send payslips to individual employees for a client. Um, I One of the favourite things that lawyer likes to do is say that's was, to send a response if that's very interesting. Could you tell me which law it breaches? And watch them go very quiet. Because to say that it's illegal or unlawful, it would have to be a direct breach of the GDPR. And there's nothing in the GDPR that says you have to adopt particular security measures regarding this aspect of it. Um, 
it may be a breach of contract depending upon what your contract says but again that's not illegal that's a breach of contract is just a basically an, an unlawful act i think going illegal might be going a little bit too far and to be honest with you it may not be unlawful anyway a breach of contract depending upon what the uh, terms of the contract were and in term the reasons behind any breaches but um again i doubt that your contract the, will state that you can't send uh, pay slips to your clients directly or the individuals so again quote article 32 of the gdpr at them or have a look at article 32 yourself and you can also have a look at paragraph because there's a bit of a preamble to the gdpr it's quite long but paragraphs 83 and paragraphs 28 that all deal with security measures not once does it say that you have to adopt particular security measures to them or you have to send data or transfer data in a particular way so um send send them an email and say well well what law could you give me the regulations could you give me the legislation that you're relying on and it'll be interesting to see what they say so paul has again um asked so the reason he's been told it's illegal is because it's sending the data through a third party, you know, your, all your, everyone's email service, Yahoo, Google, mm -hmm. which also I think sort of brings us on nicely to some other questions. There are a couple of questions with people saying, um, what well, someone said specifically, is Gmail GDPR compliant? Um, if I'm using Sage and Zero, Dropbox, Microsoft, are they data processors and do I just look at their GDPR policy on their website and confirm that that's okay? How do you assess these third party processors? Okay. All the third party, if you're talking about software com companies that uh, provide a service online like GDPR, where there's platforms, they will have to have a privacy policy web page on it. Uh, Dropbox does, I, I know this has EU US privacy shield in place. Sage does, Siri does, they have privacy policies online and you can have a look at them and make sure they're GDPR compliant. Things like uh, Gmail and the rest are, I believe Gmail is, but they, they again have websites outlying their privacy policy saying whether their EU US privacy shield uh, compliant. If they're not, it's not unlawful to send your data to a company that hasn't signed up to EU US privacy shield or a European contract clause or is even GDPR compliant. But what you do have to do is let your clients know, I'm sending the personal data to this and there is a risk that it's breached because they're not GDPR compliant. That's what all you need to do uh, so that's all you need to do. You just need to let your clients know and get your consent for sending the data to them. So there are ways around them. To, to say that it's unlawful to send stuff through third parties and the rest, um, it's, it's not. I think that's a bit of an unusual position um, for whoever's said this to take because GDPR is very much, it comes down to a risk assessment done on your basis. And to be honest with you, the GDPR only really kicks in regarding its punitive element or regarding breaches. If there is a data breach, you have to let your clients know what you're doing. You have to take into account the security risks and, and take steps to adopt them, but that's not defined. Um, and as long as you've done that, uh, there's nothing that says sending your emails via a particular route or sending particular files via a particular route is unlawful or it's not GDPR compliant. And to be honest with you, that's going to come down to the Information Commissioner's Office to decide anyway. Um, they're the people who are interpreting the regulations and then they're the people who've got the difficult job of interpreting are the security steps that this person has in place adequate? Because that's what it comes down to. There isn't a specific way to send the uh, data. There isn't a specific way to adopt procedures. There aren't specific policies you need to have in place. It comes down to your particular business to take a tailor-made approach to what is appropriate. And that's what it comes down to. So we are getting a lot of, oh, it's unlawful to do this. It's illegal to do this. I've been told that I have to have this in place. You don't. You don't have to have anything in place. But what you do need to do under the GDPR is make an assessment of the security risks, take mitigating steps, and basically just be, just be a bit sensible about the data. I mean, after the 25th of May passes, nothing much is really going to change. Regarding a question that I've just seen of regarding reissuing your contracts, you don't have to reissue your contract regarding your privacy policy. Your privacy policy may not even be part of your contract. I don't know which contract you've used regarding that. Uh, 
most contracts as a standard say that the privacy policy may be updated or changed from time to time what you could do is email your clients and say we've updated our privacy policy we're now adhering to this new privacy policy and have it available you could equally email a copy of the privacy policy the icbs changed to your clients and say this is what we're governing now this is how we're processing your data but they don't need to sign it they don't need to date it all you really need to do is show that you've made it readily available to your clients so it can either be on your website or emailed or you can say look i'll send you a copy if you want or enclose it with your next uh, annual return it's you just need to let your clients know that it's there it's available they're aware of their rights um, but you don't need to reissue any of your contracts you can just send the privacy policy on and say this is what we're governing our, our data processing by that's fantastic i think that's very helpful that's probably answered quite a few questions uh, your client does not have to write back to you to confirm they have read your privacy policy but you do need to make them aware that there is one and preferably send it to them. Why not drop them an email? It's probably the easiest way to do it. That email does not have to be encrypted. Um, okay, so someone, someone's asked, if they take credit card payments through a third party, and they think they, oh, so there are some questions around whether the clients themselves should be registered with the ICO. What I said is that, you know, maybe just advise them to use the ICO self-assessment tool on their website. Yep, yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. Let them use it. They've also, the ICO has, has a very helpful uh, helpline, um, which is very good. We've called it a couple of times just to see how it runs through. Uh, they're very good. They're very informative. They're very knowledgeable about data protection issues and how it relates to individual businesses. Um, one of the important things is that, well, I suppose ICB's approaches are responsibility and our concern is, is as our members. It's our bookkeepers. It's, it's you. Your clients, I appreciate that they're, you're concerned about them, but ultimately, whether they're GDPR compliant or not, is their responsibility, the onus is on them. And what ICB doesn't want to do is for you to start exposing yourself to any potential liability by getting involved in what your clients are GDPR compliant or start advising them they need to do this and need to do that. Just in case your clients later on, if things do turn a little bit sad, say, oh, well, my bookkeeper told me this and that, and then you could be held for some sort of, liability for that so icb's approach is certainly let them know about the gdpr let them know about the ico tool as amy said but other than that your clients will need to reach their own conclusions about gdpr our concern our overriding concern is to make sure that icb bookkeepers are gdpr compliant we've got everything in place and icb bookkeepers know uh what to do going forward and ICB bookkeepers are the best informed about GDPR within the accounting sector. I think that's true actually we've had a lot of comments on the template policy itself not uh, to the best of our knowledge none of the other bodies produce a template policy and um, Phil Kane is wondering um, should the privacy policy or should you make it, it um, make your clients aware of the specific software that you might be using to process their data, such as a certain CRM or Sage or QuickBooks? I mean, you you, sh you should do, you should have it somewhere, uh, a list of the processes that you're using so that they can see that. You can list some and say, for further reference, we can let you know who they are upon uh, request. But you do, you generally need to let your clients know who you're going to share the data with. Now, you could just use a, a rather a more broad approach of we're going to use accounting uh, services or software providers to who we will be sharing your data with, but we will ensure that they are GDPR compliant. We can provide a list if you're so asked. You do need to have a list available if it's asked for, but the important thing is that you're letting your clients know that you are sharing data with third parties and who those third parties either by an umbrella term for future clarification if it's asked for are provided um, or by individual names but the important thing is that you have gone through the steps to ensure that these third parties these software providers are gdpr compliant or have an eu us privacy shield in place or a european contract clause or equally if they don't have any of that that you're letting your client know the risks of passing the data on to a third party who doesn't have GDPR compliance um, and your clients consented to that risk. 
I wanted to say a quick hello to the business show. ICB is uh, yesterday and today is exhibiting at the business show. We've got a, a lovely big stand championing ICB bookkeepers and telling small businesses why uh, you are the best of the best. Um, and part of that obviously is our knowledge of GDPR and our readiness to comply with this, you know, the ever-changing regulation. So hello the business show, we are actually broadcasting live at the business show. Um, I'm sure if you've got any questions there, uh, small businesses, you might be able to chat with us as well. Uh, but in the meantime, um, some, uh, Sarah has asked, is there a need for a separate data retention policy or is that covered in the privacy policy? Um, that will, that's covered in the privacy policy itself. I'm just going to get the privacy notice template we've got. But regarding the data protection, retention the important thing is that you are retaining the data only for the period that you require it for you're not using it beyond that so that should be your bookkeeping contract but that also come falls into the various other legal obligations that you have so you won't need a retention policy and so separate retention policy because that falls under the storage of uh, G, well, the storage of processing the data that you need to process for the purposes of fulfilling your contract. However, what you will also need to do is keep that data for the purposes of the Companies Act 2006, the Taxes Management Act 1970, which means you have to keep that data for the six years regardless. And that trumps GDPR, so that hasn't really changed anyway. You still need to keep the data for that purpose. Okay, fantastic. Okay, that's interesting. Um, there's a question from Alison Duncan here. Um, she's saying that she, she works for an, an accountant mm -hmm. and their contract is based on her letter of engagement with them. Yep. Um, she's also mentioned, obviously, that she's done due diligence on persons with significant authority. Obviously, that will become, um, uh, that's obviously part of your AML uh, duty. Um, does she, is that right that she doesn't have a specific subcontractor contract with them? Is it okay to continue with the letter of engagement? It's, no, it's absolutely fine to continue with the letter of engagement. What you will need to do is make sure that you are GDPR compliant. So again, get some policies procedures in place, have a bit of a risk assessment of your own uh, business. Basically make sure that your business is GDPR compliant. What will happen in that sort of situation is that your account, the accountants are the data controllers. You're going to be the data processor um, if you're working for them. So on that basis, they are ultimately responsible. They're the ones who will need the GDPR compliance policies, everything in place. Because uh, as we were discussing earlier, the buck stops with them at the end of the day if there is a data breach, even at your end. If there's a data breach, they're going to be the ones responsible. Um, you could be tied into that, of course. Um, and you you do have some responsibility as well. So the only thing you really need to, in that regard, is make sure you're GDPR compliant. Let them know that you've updated your privacy policies. Let them know that you're GDPR compliant. Um, but in that sort of relationship where that happens, you're going to be the data processor. So the best thing you can do is make sure you're GDPR compliant. They, they should really be asking to make sure you're GDPR compliant, but um, hopefully they'll do that before the 25th. That's lovely. I think that uh, we've only, we've got, I think this will be our last question now. Um, Alison Duncan says, perfect. Thank you, by the way. Um, Kimberly has just asked, I think this is just further clarification of what you've just said. Is there a scenario in which the accountant that you're working with is the data controller, but you are also a data controller. Oh, um, yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a good question because I'm, I'm afraid the answer is going to be a little bit convoluted. And if it gets if it gets too much, I'm hoping Amy. Um, well, we've got Amy to, we've got six no, minutes no, until uh, eleven okay. a.m. So okay, brilliant. Um, <laughs> so the way to look at it is to divide the, uh, the roles of data processor and data controller. Data controller is when you get the personal data in yourself and you're relying on one of the lawful bases to process it and it's, it's uh, a processing that you're doing without very specific or limited instructions of what you do with the personal data. So performance of a contract, you're using the data to deal with it in that regard or legitimate interest you're maintaining or storing the data for the purposes of the Companies Act or the Tax Management Act. So now it's when you're in control of the data. 
you're going to be the data controller. When you start getting data, personal data, through a third party, such as the accountants, and it comes with a set of instructions attached to it, then you're going to be a data processor. So if the clients are with the accountants and they're passing the data on to you to say, we need you just to run the payroll, we need you just to do the VAT returns on this, then you're going to be a data processor because you've got set limited instructions on how you process the data and the very limited purposes of what you do with that personal data. Um, because it's not just a fulfillment of a con contract that's between you and the person giving you the personal data, it's coming through a third party with attached instructions or limitations on what you do with it. However, in that regard, you'd be a data processor, but that accountant could say, we've got too many clients, we want you to take on some clients as well. In that regard, again, when you start getting the data in directly, you're going to be the data controller in that regard, even if it's a referral from the accountant. So the way to look at it is, is the personal data coming through a third party? If it is coming through a third party, you're likely to be a data processor. Are there a set of limiting instructions attached to it? Again, that means you're likely to be a data processor. Or is the personal data coming directly from the data subject themselves? In that case, you're likely to be a data controller because there's not this very limited line of instruction. There's not this third party involvement who's passing the data on. If that's, does that answer it or is I'm um, hopefully I think you've, I think you've done it that seems very clear to me but as you said before you know there are slight the chain can become slightly convoluted um but I think that's reasonably clear but always if you've got your your privacy policy in place and you've told your clients about it then that is a very wise and sensible step to take to make sure that you are GDPR uh, compliant Absolutely, because regardless of whether you're a data processor or a data controller, the important thing above everything is that you're GDPR compliant. You've got your policies in place, you've got your procedures in place, you've done your risk assessments, you've basically done every step that you need to to make sure you're GDPR compliant. And as long as you've done that, regardless of whether you're the data processor or the data controller, you've done what you've needed and ICB has helped limit the exposure and liability that you as a bookkeeper may have to any potential data breach in a worst case scenario and we are again discussing worst case scenarios that is wonderful okay well, uh, i think that's going to be the conclusion of our webinar here today thank you ever so much for joining us i hope you found it useful and um, there are the three documents three gdpr documents um, are available for free for members in practice that's in the running your business area of the website in the in the download section there. Um, Alison Duncan says it's been truly excellent. That makes me very happy. Um, clear and reassuring, that was the aim. So those documents are available online for members in practice. If you are desperate to get hold of them and you're not yet in practice, um, or you are a student and you want to have a look, or you're an IAGSA member whom we supervise for AML, you can now purchase those documents for 99 pounds in the online shop. And uh, we will, email you a copy of this webinar by the end of the week so that you can watch it ever more and we'll also make available a copy of the data flow diagram that you could use as a template within your practice um, well thanks for all these lovely messages guys uh, have a wonderful day and keep doing great work for the country's businesses good afternoon oh, good afternoon <laughs>